Welcome to the uh, our weekly updates, Council of the Whole meeting. We are joined by uh, Councillor Letterman, Councillor Walsh, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Ramos, Councillor uh, Fenton, Councillor Whitfield, Councillor Davila. Uh, we also look like we're joined by Tom Ash, uh, Commissioner Harris, Solicitor Pakula, and Superintendent Danny Warwick. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will get started so as to be cognizant of everybody's time. Uh, Commissioner, we will start with you and your updates. Thank you very much. I hope everyone is well and staying safe. Um, so this is an update for June 9th for the City of Springfield. Um, I will quickly uh, go through the data. Uh, the data is 104,156 for the state. Um, Hamden County, 6,395, which is 61, 6.14 percent of the state. The City of Springfield currently is 2,504, which is 2. 40% of the state and 39.15% of the county. The deaths at this point are 7,454 for the state, Hamden County 629. The city of Springfield, well, 629 is 8.43% of the state. The city of Springfield. We okay? Okay, the city of Springfield um, is 112 which is 17.80% of the county. Last one I reported to you, the city of Springfield was, a, was 102. Um, the um, white uh, deaths went up two. The Hispanic deaths went up five. The um, black deaths went up two. The Asian deaths went up one, which is 112. So, of that 112, the 55 for the white population is 49.10% of the 112. The uh, 32 is 28.57% uh, for the Hispanic population, black 23, 20.53%, and the two Asian 1.78% of that total. Right now, 54 of those deaths are in the long-term care facilities. That's 48.21%. Uh, 58 are residential, which is 51.78%. Overall, the city has been doing well in our cases. On Sunday, we had four, <clears throat> Monday, five, Tuesday, 10, and yesterday we had um, 10 um, as well. I know that you have probably seen the paper where we have shuttered. Uh, the tent, and um, we had our last guest uh, there yesterday. Uh, the uh, deep cleaning is happening right now, and so we're uh, moving through that uh, at this point. We are prepared and ready to stand up the tents if we need to. Again, the staff is still in place. The structure is in place. We have an MOU with STCC until July 30th. If we need to extend it for any reason, uh, the mayor will have that conversation uh, with uh, the president and the board of trustees. But right now, uh, at this point, the tent is not uh, operational. Um, so that is uh, my report. Um, let me just simply say that Councillor Whitfield asked me about testing. Uh, she wanted to know about some data uh, as far as testing was concerned in the city of Springfield. Um, I've asked the state for that data. I don't have it, Councillor Whitfield, but I've asked them for it because they uh, do keep some demographic data. It's my understanding that it's not um, concrete in many cases. And so I have checked um, on that for you. Um, phase one, uh, many of you know about the barbershops and hairdressers are opening for the first time. We have not received um, uh, many complaints about uh, how people are behaving as far as their um, their barbershops and hairdressers are concerned. During phase two, we will continue to work uh, through the department uh, to make sure that uh, what we can control is being adhered to as far as the guidance is concerned uh, from the um, governor. Testing is still being done mainly for symptomatic individuals. We have not gotten to the place where we are uh, testing broadly for asymptomatic individuals. And so that's um, very important to say. We still believe that testing is um, 
and vaccine are really um, critical to our opening up uh, the city again uh, fully. Uh, and the nation, actually. Um, so we continue to ask folks to um, adhere to the non-pharmaceutical interventions, and you all know them well. Do not shake hands, hug, wear a face covering, stay home if you're sick, hand hygiene, and social distancing. And the last thing I'll say is contact tracing continues to be very important to our response. Um, and so we're working very hard to make sure we're in touch with all of those people who have um, had uh, close contact with someone who is positive. So thank you very much, counselors. So thank you, uh, Commissioner and Councilor Whitfield. I know you have your hands up, but before we take any questions, uh, Tom and or Solicitor, I know as of Monday was the, was uh, we entered phase two. Uh, if you could just give a quick highlight as to what that entailed and also um, how that looks uh, differently potentially in Springfield or what are some of the things that we should be cognizant of? I know you guys have done some work around the outdoor, uh, outdoor dining. Uh, if you could just give us a brief overview and then we'll open it up for questions for you all and um, then we'll get right to Superintendent Warwick who will take out the rest of our meeting. Sure. Um, uh, as you know, the governor announced uh, last Saturday that uh, on Monday, we, he would be allowing the restaurants to open. We had uh, the week before some guidance, uh, but we had the final guidance on uh, uh, on that Saturday where we had put out an application for the reopening that was limited to outdoor uh, venues that uh, um, there are some very specific rules uh, to comply with work place safety standards and uh, safe standards for patrons uh, in, with regard to the capacity uh, that may be available on a, on a patio type of situation. The ABCC has put out guidance. We have gathered all of that together in our application process, which um, I would describe to you as a hybrid between uh, sort of what we do for one day permits and for what we do for change of description of, per, of, of premises permits. Uh, the difference is that they've been melded together and an overlap of the COVID requirements has been added. Um, uh, while we have experience from dining outside for some places, uh, we, no one has experience of dealing with uh, uh, the outside dining with the COVID requirements. So, um, we're adjusting and trying to uh, help people uh, comply with those requirements. We're accepting applications. We've accepted applications. We're, um, um, we're, we're dealing with it on the, on the fly, if you will, and um, uh, to try to help and encourage people to get open ASAP. Um, we have not designated any streets for closing. We're leaving that to uh, um, applicants to say, hey, I would like the plans for closing, and we have a process for that, and so that has been implemented with regard to Fort Street. I think that's the only one at this time where we, we've had, had an application for that. But um, I think we have received a number of, of permits that we've been in the, the middle of processing, and many places have opened. Um, uh, already, and uh, we will continue to move forward. Um, we are uh, uh, trying to, uh, as I said, field questions from a lot of uh, applicants and provide guidance to say what uh, portions of their applications may be missing. Uh, and we're trying to adjust um, uh, because it's all new to, to everyone. Um, so far, um, I think it's been uh, fairly smooth, um, but uh, I think we're all looking to the point where we can all go indoor for a meal as well. Uh, as you know, the bars have been pushed back to phase four, so that's still a ways out, uh, but we're hopeful that the governor will allow uh, some indoor dining at restaurants uh, before that. 
Thank you, solicitor. Uh, Tom, did you want to add anything from the administration standpoint? We're only, uh, Council President, that uh, we were enthusiastic about getting, we we're mindful that uh, although many of us have been fortunate to be working for the last you know, 90 days, many, many work, particularly in this industry. So we were, uh, uh, the mayor was very, very concerned, uh, wanted to get this uh, industry back open. In fact, he paid a visit to a couple of uh, establishments over the, this week uh, in the downtown area and uh, was very pleased with, with the outcome. As, as the solicitor said, we still got some work to do, um, but uh, you know, we're, we're hopeful that it's, uh, it's gonna be a school that's as it started out to be. Thank you. I see we have a number of hands in the queue. I just want counselors to be mindful that we also want to leave a sufficient amount of time to uh, hear from our superintendent, uh, Daniel Warwick. Uh, so just, just be mindful as we move forward. Counselor Whitfield, followed by Counselor Walsh and Counselor Ramos. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Commissioner, I just wanted to commend you and say thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, a couple of your staff was at the C3 meeting on Tuesday and they told us exactly what went into um, con contact tracing and um, it's a lot of work and I know your staff um, have taken over responsibilities that they haven't had in the, future, in, in the past. So I just wanted to thank you for the hard work that um, you all are doing. And then I just wanted to ask if you knew um, what the cost is for one um, COVID-19 test is? I do not. Um, uh, we have not, um, to my knowledge, uh, the first responders and the other individuals that we have sent from the city have not paid. And I think that COVID-19 right now is uh, covered by a third party. Uh, that would be mass health and or private insurance. But I'm not sure what that number is, Council, but I'm happy uh, to check for you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Whitfield and Councilor Walsh, followed by Councilor Ramos. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, Attorney Pakula, for that. You know, I think we're all anxious to see uh, restaurants reopen because we don't want to see them close, and we know how difficult this has been for them. Uh, I have been following the situation with Nadine's. Were they able to open, or were they kind of caught uh, in some sort of red tape hassle? Uh, no, he had made a mistake. He had not submitted an application. and He actually uh, had apologized for oh, good. the confusion. Okay. Uh, but he's open. He's open and uh, uh, all is well. Okay. So um, there are no, the, there is outdoor dining, outdoor dining, but there are no restroom facilities, correct? No, they're, they're available. They're available. Oh, they are. People, can they go into the restaurant? Yes, like one at a time. Oh, okay. All right. You can't, oh, that's good to know. you can't go to the bar. Okay. Thanks for clearing that up. Thank you, Councillor Walsh, Councillor Ramos, followed by Councillor Davila. Mr. President, thank you. My question is for uh, Commissioner Hudden. Um, I was wondering, uh, just wanted to follow up on our discussion regarding masks for senior citizens. I was wondering if we've made any progress on that. Yeah, and I apologize because I should have gone put that in my comments. Um, so the Department of Elder Affairs, as I sent to you in an uh, email, has uh, made 1,500 cloth masks that they have uh, distributed to uh, the, the individuals who uh, frequented all of the senior centers throughout the city of Springfield. The other thing that we are going to do, I have asked for 5,000 additional uh, masks so that we can figure out a distribution point. I'm not sure that we can do them door to door, Counselor, but I certainly think that we can make them available at a pickup point. Um, once that is, once we do not, and we'll make them particularly for the, and specifically for our elder population. So thank you for the recommendation. Thank you for following up with me. And uh, we have, as I said, we have given out 1,500. We have 200 more cloth masks that we wanted to save for people who could potentially uh, come to the senior center. But again, uh, thank you for following up with me. And I will let you know when those 5,000 masks are available. Sounds good, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ramos, Councillor Davila. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, everybody. I uh, just want a quick, uh, two quick questions for it, uh, Attorney Picula. Um, I'm glad to see that we're moving forward with the uh, 
outdoor dining and uh, for that process, is there any fee involved in the application process? No, there's no application fee. Clearly, if someone says, hey, I want to open, I want to build a patio, well, then they'd have to go through the normal building permit process. Mm -hmm. Or similarly, if someone says, I want to put a tent up, there is a tent permit that is separate and apart. I do know okay. there's also a street closing fee, but DPW, my understanding is, uh, has been making some adjustments to what the normal fee is, given the circumstances. And in terms of the response, uh, are we getting the response that we thought we would get from the city? Um, I know here in Forest Park, I'm a little surprised that nobody has uh, opened up. And as far as I know, nobody has applied, which, which I'm a little surprised. Um, I, I, did, I didn't catch the last part. You were surprised nobody uh, has opened In Forest Park, as far as <clears throat> my understanding is nobody has uh, applied as of yet uh, for the outdoor Permitting. I, so I just want kind of wonder and compare it to the yeah. rest of the city. Let me, let me tell you some of the feedback we're getting. Um, I we have heard from some places uh, that um, have existing patios, um, and uh, we have, would expect them to um, potentially open up, but they have determined that's really not worth it uh, to do so, and they're they've elected to wait. And I, I think there's a lot of wait and see going on. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, one of the things that people might be looking to is whether the demand is there. Right. Um, and and there, there may be. And, uh, you know, I think those who have been getting calls from their customers or potential customers have probably, you know, uh, been at the forefront of implementing this. Uh, others, um, you know, uh, particularly places that may have some change uh, uh, in other states or some experience or have done some uh, other marketing, um, uh, you know, that, that, that it appears that many places have elected not to at this time. They may, and, they, and, and to be to quite frank, we little surprised that we didn't get more of a response, but now that I see what's going on, it's, it's probably right where it should be. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davila. Um, we also are joined by Councillor Allen. Uh, Councillor Allen, I know you're on your phone, so if you uh, do wish to speak, then you, you, kinda, you can either text me or you, you'll just have to jump in. I see no other hands raised in the queue, so uh, thank you for, to those in the Situation Room, and we'll turn everything over at this time to uh, Superintendent, oh. did I, uh, Councillor Walsh. Uh, before we get into um, uh, hearing from the superintendent, I did have one question. I wasn't sure if I should address it to um, uh, to Eddie or to Tom Tom Ash, but you know, I think all of us are hearing a lot of complaints about fireworks. Uh, there seem to be a lot more of them going around. There's certainly a lot in the uh, Forest Park area. People want to know um, what can be done and is is there going to be any kind of a response to it? I don't know how you find out who's doing them or, or how difficult that is. Sure. But Eddie, you've probably heard them. They're all over the park. I, I, let, I, I think Tom's going to respond, but let me just say, uh, last night I had a, a long night, and then I'd gotten up very early this morning, and uh, knock on wood, it was reduced compared to how it had been some of the nights before. So. But I, I hear you in some of the past nights. <laughs> uh, well, unfortunately, a lot of people don't realize they're fireworks and they're afraid they're the start or something else. We, we discovered it, Counselor uh, Walsh, and one of the people came up and one person said, I, you know, I'm hearing a, an awful lot of fireworks in my neighborhood. And as we worked our way around the room, it turned out everybody has been hearing. So it's in every part of the city. And so the commissioner has responded by putting a, um, a squad together that can dress and chest the fireworks. And hopefully, uh, as Solicitor Pakula said, the reduction is based on some of that, kind of going out and figuring out where it is and <clears throat> targeting some areas and, and hopefully, you know, the idea of reducing it because it's, it did get out of hand. It's late, late at night and it's not your typical fireworks. It's very loud uh, and those things. So I think, and I hope that uh, that, that squad is having an effect. Yeah. So is, it, is there like a, a number of people call if they're concerned? Or? Very much so. 
many, many calls to our office, Councilor Walsh. Okay. From Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Walsh. Councilor Whitfield, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, it'll be brief. Um, yeah, the fireworks have reduced a lot since the press release went out in my neighborhood, so I'm glad, glad of that. But um, Commissioner, I just wanted to remind you that I do want to give a donation toward the mask. I've been trying to order masks myself, but I think I'm going to China, so I'm not getting them. So I don't want to order any um, for you guys, but I would like to contribute to um, Health and Human Services to purchase masks. So um, whenever you figure out how we can do that, that would be helpful. Thank you, Council Whitfield. I'm very appreciative of your reaching out and wanting to put some of your resources towards um, serving the seniors in Springfield. So thank you for the offer. At this point, I'm not sure that we're going to um, need to do that based on the fact that okay. I'm going to try to use CARES money to purchase if I can, but I appreciate your reaching out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Whitfield. And I just want to remind counselors that we do want to take advantage of Superintendent Warwick, being that we have him here now and we normally uh, don't or aren't able to take advantage of his presence. Councillor Davila. Thank you, Mr. President. I will be very brief. Uh, Tom, just to uh, follow up on the fireworks issue, I agree. I, I, every night I have uh, an orchestra out of my window at like 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, so I, I know the commissioner is putting together a detail uh, I'm just wondering if you could, one, tell me or take a stab as to what's causing this, and two, what will the police department do? Uh, what are the fines and what, are, what actions are they going to take? Um, I would venture to say, Councilor Daniel, that the, the fireworks, the, the increase, uh, the obvious increase is a result of the, the unease on a national level. I don't think it's unique to Springfield. Um, and so the second part of your question was, uh, what kind of um, uh, actions they're going to take? Uh, it fines imposed. I'm sure they're going to confiscate the fireworks, so forth and so on. Yeah, there is an ordinance. I think um, uh, Councilor Gomez shared that on his social media, and we have as well. That that speaks to that. What the fines are and what the uh, options are to police when they come upon situations like this. Um, so there there is an ordinance on the book, and uh, my my sense that they're following it. Thank you, Tom. Tom, can you send us, can you send everybody on the council uh, the ordinance so that they are aware, please? And also, Commissioner, can you send us an email with the updated numbers that you provided for us at the begin beginning of the meeting when you get the opportunity, please? Happy to do that as well. I think that Bill Baker puts my numbers up every day. Um, okay. Well, I think, uh, but let me check in with him. If not, I'll make sure you get them. Thank you so much. All right, since there are no other questions in the queue, uh, we will turn it over to Superintendent Warwick. Uh, Superintendent Warwick, it's a pleasure to have you before the council today. Uh, please don't be a stranger. I know there are gonna be a lot of developments that occur uh, over the summer. And so before school starts, we would love to hear from you, from you again. Um, but please, the floor is yours. Uh, why don't you start off by giving us an overview as to what is happening, what are the plans for the summer? And if you know as of yet, what are some of the plans for reopening of school in the fall, uh, if that is in the plans? You, everyone, and uh, thanks for inviting me to participate today. Uh, right now, um, Springfield's been engaged with the rest of the school systems in the Commonwealth in a situation with remote learning. School closed on uh, for us on March 12th, and uh, we went to a remote situation. We were very, very fortunate. The school committee was very supportive when we um, actually made it a priority in our budget some five years ago to go one-to-one -one with our laptops. So unlike a lot of communities, especially urban centers, we were able to distribute laptops to, to all our families, any, any student who needed or wanted one to use at home. So we, di we distributed actually 17,000 laptops between the students who were on take-home and students who weren't on a take-home situation already who wanted a laptop, we were able to either have them come to the school and pick it up, but if they couldn't, we used one of our transportation companies to deliver them and we actually delivered them to the houses. The other uh, piece was the connectivity piece and we provided every family that asked us for help, help with the connectivity situation, even to the point where we actually uh, funded hotspots for a lot of families. So again, trying to provide uh, access for every student our teachers have been reaching out, um, working with the students uh, regularly and remotely. 
And given the training that we provided in the PD for the last five years, our, our teachers were more adept at uh, using technology for instruction than again, most others in the Commonwealth. So we're all doing our best with that. I think it's a challenge. It's working in a different way, but I think we had a leg up on it. And I think um, I looked at our participation rates or finalized lies and look at them, but I think they're significantly higher than most of the other rates in the Commonwealth. We set up a situation where with every family that's participating, we're following through regularly. Any family that wasn't participating, there was multiple reach outs from the school, uh, teacher, counselor, administrators, to provide assistance to help them reach out. Any um, family that had a technology issue, our uh, technology department was replacing laptops or working with the families on those issues. So I feel that's going very well. I looked at our participation rates and they look significantly higher than again, I saw in other places in the Commonwealth. So I think the investment in technology that we made some years back really uh, paid dividends with this, but it's still a challenging situation for families to, you know, uh, parents are working remotely sometimes or having to go off to work and students are trying to uh, do the work from home. So we've been as supportive as we can to all of our families. Our counselors have also been reaching out to families because a lot of our families have experienced some trauma and this is a very difficult situation. So our counselors, our City Connects workers have been reaching out trying to provide all the mental health supports that we provide in school. On the meal front, we've um, provided over a million meals from 18 different distribution points uh, in every neighborhood in the city. And we're gonna continue with those sites all summer and probably into the fall as needed. But that's gone very well. Um, you know, Pat Roach, my team, did a great job working with Sodexo. And we've uh, not only provided uh, the, the, the meals, but tried to also improve the quality of the meals. And we've actually distributed produce through some grants. So I think the meal piece has gone very well. For the summer, we're planning on a remote summer program as are most other districts in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Due to the guidelines, in order to come back to school, it would be very difficult to offer a live program. But we're gonna offer all of our normal summer programs, all the course recovery programs we need for our high school students, all the remedial programs for some of our elementary and middle school students are gonna be in place. And in addition, the school committee uh, is, is working with me to appropriate about 250 extra thousand dollars to offer enrichment programs to all students who wanna continue to participate in remote learning over the summer. So we're gonna monitor that. So we're gonna leave our laptops out at the homes so that the kids can use them over the summer. And anyone who wants to participate, we're gonna encourage them to participate. We're gonna set up raffles and rewards to encourage participation, hoping to make up for some of the learning loss with, with this whole move to technology. Uh, some of the transitions some of the families had. Um, as far as next year, the, the guidance we've received from DESE so far has been that the commissioner is encouraging districts to look towards opening with a hybrid model. Um, looks like the most we could probably put in the buildings given the current social distancing guidelines is about 50% of the students. So we're taking a look at, you know, what could we do with 25, 50%? How could we get them back and forth to school? A transportation, I think some of the social distancing guidelines are more of a challenge with transportation than even in our classrooms. But most of our classrooms are 20 to 25 and they'd have to be 10 to 12 with the social distancing guidelines. So we'd probably be in a week A, week B, or day A, day B situation and rotating the kids in with half uh, coming into school and the other half working remotely. For our staff, folks who have pre existing conditions, we'd probably assign those folks to work remotely and the other staff would be providing the live services to the students who are coming in. We're working now to acquire the PPE that's gonna be re required to open school. And I've got a reopening team working that's gonna work all through the summer so that we're prepared for what comes. But it looks to me at this point that the commissioner is going to be pretty prescriptive relative to a hybrid model for the schools 
uh, relative to the requirements that it's going to be to re-enter, but he's not going to let everyone in the state just do their own thing. And I think that's a good thing because it's uh, that consistency is very important for our workforce. So we're, we're planning for that reopening. It's a huge logistical challenge with all the PPE we're going to have to acquire and, you know, all the... Uh, modifications we're going to have to make uh, to our buildings. But I will tell you that the transportation is an enormous challenge. So we're going to work with a, we're hiring a consultant uh, to take a look at the transportation with us because those requirements were on a regular bus, we can put up to 60 students, sometimes 65 going to an elementary school. We're going to be down to 10 or 12 students. So the transportation piece is going to be an enormous logistical challenge, but we're working on it and we'll be ready for whatever uh, the commissioner wants us to execute in the fall for our families. Thank you, Superintendent. We have a question in the queue uh, by Councilor Whitfield. From Thank, you, Council. President. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, I appreciate the update. I know we all do. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, first, I want to thank you because I, I had my niece and two nephews, one in kindergarten, one in fourth grade, one in um, sixth grade um, over, and I was trying to help them get through their work and assignments. And I, and I can tell you that it was hard for me to read the, the work that they had to do. It was different on every level. Um, kindergarten was pretty easy but the other two um, was difficult. So I, I, I called every one of their teachers. They were all responsive. Every single one of them um, responded back to me and um, because they don't have the support system at home. And so that my, my nephew in the sixth grade didn't get on the computer and do any work for the whole six weeks. So he was not failing the semesters before, but I don't know how that's going to affect him. And how is it determined that he has to go to summer school? Um, it, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, the participation rates were really monitoring very closely, but we did work uh, with a, a different grading system, understanding the challenges you just mentioned that exist for a lot of our families. So uh, we went to a credit, no credit for the fourth quarter. We ended the third quarter grades. We closed the grades on March 12th, the day we execute, we exited, so that uh, the kids could have earned their full grade by then. So they got graded in a traditional manner up, up to what they had done by March 12th. For the fourth quarter, um, we're just doing a credit, no credit, and the kids have to turn in certain assignments just to get credit. So it's a, a system that takes into account that you know, it, it has been a challenge for a lot of students and a lot of families. So, you know, it's a very generous system relative to it. If they try to participate, they're going to get credit. And then they'd pass for the year. And if they didn't try to participate, <laughs> they have to go to summer school? Well, no, if they passed the first three quarters and were doing well, there's, there's no credit. We set it up in a way they'd pass for the year. Okay. Try to be very, very fair to the families. And now we are offering summer school enrichment opportunities for everyone who wants to engage, mm -hmm. but on, the only required summer schools are free, by, based on the other requirements. But if are they were passing any, the first three quarters, they're in good shape. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any tutoring systems out there? I know that Springfield College offer tutors, but are there any through the Springfield Public Schools to help um, the kids? Because I know some families' parents can't even do some of the math they do or don't teach it the same way. So are there any um, tutors that can help? All of the schools have been reaching out to families and all of the teachers are engaged. So they should call the principal at their school for any help they need. And there's, there's certainly help available. Absolutely. They we want to help every family that needs it. And when I looked at our participation rates, I was really proud of our teachers, our counselors, mm -hmm. and our principals. They worked very hard to reach out to several families. We did a log, so for folks who weren't participating, how many times we contacted them, and a few of the ones I checked, they had made six different contacts to the family from different people, be it the counselor, different teachers, principal, to really find a way to help families get engaged in a positive way. 
They absolutely have. And I, I know, I'm sorry, Mr. President, I know we got to get to other people, but they absolutely have. I can tell you that I'm not the parent, but they were still calling me because I reached out for help and they still keep me in the loop as to what is going on. Um, when I called the mom, she kind of shut me off so I can't talk to the kids anymore to see what's going on because she thought I was criticizing her, um, which I wasn't. I was just trying to help them. And so um, I, I did ask the teachers to continue to try to communicate through her, but just to keep me in the loop so when I do get them, I can help them. But I can tell you that your staff has been amazing. They contact the kids a minimum of twice a week to try to help them. They get them on Zoom calls. They do a lot to try to catch them up. And I just wanted to say thank you um, for that. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Councilor Whitfield, Councilor Letterman, followed by Councilor Walsh. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hi, Superintendent. Thanks for being with us. Hi, Jesse. Uh, I was wondering if you could just uh, explain a little bit more about um, what the hybrid process might look like in the in the new year, and then also what type of professional development uh, we might be giving to teachers to to help them cope with the new. Mm -hmm. Uh, requirements. I know that uh, certainly, you know, the work that our teachers have done thus far is nothing short of amazing, um, you know, given the short notice that uh, they had and how quickly everything came about. Um, certainly, they're doing a great job, but just wondering kind of what our plans look like for the fall with regard to that. Yeah, so the hybrid model for the fall would involve, you know, about 50% of the time in school, the way it looks right now. So I've seen the commissioner present a plan for week A, week B, talk to some other superintendents and they're looking at like certain days every week. So I've seen one superintendent talk about maybe a plan for Monday and Tuesday in school for group A, Wednesday for the entire staff to focus on remote learning and then Thursday and Friday for group B with the deep cleaning and sanitizing occurring between the two groups. So those kind of, of plans you, you see coming forward and we'll continue to work with the commissioner's office on developing those over the year. For staff, we're lucky. We have a lot of professional development. We've done a tremendous amount of professional development during this crisis for our staff because folks were freed up from their normal duties working with the kids in any flexible time we were working in PLCs and providing PD. We also bring our staff back a week before school opens and provide even more PD for staff. And there'll be PD using the technology, we're also doing some significant diversity training for us. So we always have an aggressive uh, PD program. We have seven full days of professional development built into the schedule, four before school opens with convocation day, so opportunities for more then, and then three during the school year for staff. But during this situation, we've been on providing PD every day to staff. That's great. And, and as we kind of make the decisions about the upcoming uh, school year, how, how closely are we communicating with and making sure there's input from uh, the teachers union, the paraprofessionals union, and, and folks like that? Yeah, we're meeting with the, all the unions every week to communicate with them relative to what's going on on the local level. So we, we've done that here in Springfield. We usually meet once a month or in this crisis, we decided weekly was needed because communication is the key. But uh, the commissioner actually has members of MTA and AFT on his reopening team. So as the decisions are getting made statewide, the unions are represented and are at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Letterman, Councillor Walsh. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Superintendent, good to see you. Nice uh, to I see also you. want to congratulate you on the, uh, the wonderful effort you've been making through this crisis. I think. Uh, your teachers and supports, you all deserve an A++. I want to tell you, I'm so happy that you were able to give meals. I was so concerned about the children that needed to get the meals and get, having the access to the meals. I, I think you're doing a super job. Um, I wonder in particular about your remote uh, teaching. What's happening to two of my favorites, the art and music that we were so excited about offering to everybody? So I mean, we're can asking, you do that remotely? Yeah, we're asking those teachers to also reach out and come up with ways to engage the students and their families with everything. That's a little different than the basic academics, but we have those folks on the teams trying to incorporate that because you don't want the kids on a computer with just right. learning activities all day. So we're trying to get the other teachers to bring some of those encores and suggestions for families on what they can do with that because that's really important. But we made that effort and 
you know, I saw some communities decided through this crisis for next year, they'd be laying off some of the Encore teachers. And, uh, we are not uh, going in that direction at all. Do you anticipate any layoffs? I, I'm hoping we can avoid layoffs. I'm hoping we can uh, cope with the budget, but to be honest, we haven't received any firm numbers from the state, so it's still a work in progress. But we're trying not to lay off, so any positions we lose will be simply through attrition. So we're not gonna have layoffs, but uh, will we have the positions we had this year? I don't know yet. We don't have our Chapter 70 appropriation yet, so we'll have to take the post. Well, uh, you're doing a great job. I'm very proud of the staff. They've been incredible. Thank you, Councillor Walsh, Councillor Davila. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good morning, uh, Superintendent. I'm glad to see you doing well. Hi, Victor. David, good morning. Uh, it's a quick question, just uh, two quick questions regarding the PPEs, which are so critical. Um, do you have an estimation of how much equipment we are going to need, uh, not only to get us through this crisis, but also to the potential second wave? And, and also on the expenditure side of that, with those PPE, um, are you going to be able to cover that expense okay? Is that going to be incorporated into the budget uh, for next year? Or are you, it's going to be deficit spent. So make sure that you have the resources you need. Yeah, so we're, we're working on the PPE appropriations now. Uh, the commissioner sent out last week uh, some guidance relative to the requirements. The requirements were more significant than we expected. So we're working on putting all those orders together now. I'm hoping um, we will build it in. We won't deficit spend for it, but we, we were hoping that um, if there's some FEMA money coming to the city that um, with that PPE equipment, um, the mayor can help us and the council with some of that spending so we won't have to take it out of education dollars. But I'm, I'm sure that the consultant TJ mentioned a couple of weeks ago yeah. maybe. Okay, thanks. Uh, exactly. uh, superintendent, and so transportation, when you were talking about transportation, in my mind, I got ahead of just thinking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's so what it <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a huge uh, uh, a logistical challenge, but the first thing that came to my mind was uh, the special needs too. Um, you know, can you comment briefly? I, I, they, I, I will, my educator guess what they will be impacted the most. Um, can you comment on this? How are we going to handle that? Or are they going to be learning from home? So uh, the special education piece is probably the trickiest piece to navigate, but it's all very, very tricky. You know, special ed vans are minivans, typically 15, 16 kids per van. We can probably only fit four or five. So what we're doing right now is we're reaching out to every family, seeing which families would want to stay remote, be they special ed or regular ed. Some families are gonna want to do that. They're not gonna feel safe sending their kids back. And we've been told by the commissioner we should honor that, and we will honor that. So we'll continue to work with them remotely. Uh, some families will want to come in, but may not want to use transportation, be it regular or special education. So uh, in that case, we, we let them come in, and that'll help us with the transportation, and they don't want them on public transportation. But the students who require special transportation will be providing that. You know, like we always do, we'll just have to work out those rooting challenges, which are going to be significant, and look at what kind of PPE we can use, and we're studying that now to execute that transportation plan. But that's a significant challenge. There is a piece of the special ed law that we've talked to the commissioner about, where some families of special ed students, should they want to transport, we could reimburse them for the transportation and not buy it. So. Okay. So uh, we'll be looking at that too. But right now our school staffs are reaching out to every family and seeing what their will is for next year. And we're gonna try to organize around that the best we can. And the transportation is probably the most significant challenge we have. Well, thank you, Superintendent, and, and stay well. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Councillor Davila. Since there are no other questions in the queue, uh, Councillor Allen or Councillor Fain, I know you haven't had the opportunity to chime in. Councillor Allen, I know you were on your phone for the first half of the meeting. Uh, are you all all set, or did you want to ask a question? 
Okay. Um, saying that I didn't hear a response, I will conclude with uh, a question of my own, um, as well as, or actually I'll conclude with two statements. One, uh, I received a phone call, uh, Superintendent Warwick, around a constituent wanting to actually be able to visualize what it is that the schools will look like in terms of seating. Uh, I think they just wanted uh, for you to be as transparent as possible. Uh, so I don't know if we can show like a mock uh, picture of what it will look like in the classrooms. Um, I certainly know that might be difficult considering every school is different, but it might make sense to give us some sort of uh, mock representation, whether it's on the buses or in the classrooms as to how uh, it will, how school will be conducted considering uh, all of the social distancing uh, requirements that are now in place or will be in place. Uh, so that was the first comment. The second comment is congratulations on the, uh, um, the individual at SciTech who was accepted into uh, every Ivy League uh, in uh, every Ivy League school um, in the country. I thought that was pretty impressive. Uh, my my comment slash recommendation also includes a hope that we can figure out, and I know my wife's going to kill me, that we can figure out some way in which we can acknowledge uh, her success uh, and figure out how to honor her. I know there are some issues around her being the valedictorian, but I've heard a lot of pushback uh, around um, that. I certainly understand that there is a policy in place, uh, but there are a lot of people who are disappointed uh, and would like to see uh, maybe co-valedictorians. I don't know if that is possible, but some sort of solution around that as they feel that uh, anyone who gets accepted into all of the Ivy League schools ought to be recognized. And, you know, I, I, I get why, uh, I get the policy, um, you know, but if there's a way around it, this seems like the time in which we should make that exception. They're very proud of Roberta. What she accomplished is absolutely incredible. Met with her and her mom. We had a great discussion about it. Obviously, when you have guidelines in place uh, with a valedictorian salutatorian, there's going to be a one winner and a lot of folks who were looking to, to get those awards and distinctions. By our criteria, you know, she did not um, win it and other student did. And uh, our criteria is based, was based on a committee that Yolanda Johnson put together some years ago. So we'd have firm guidelines in place to follow so that the decision was really based on a firm, consistent criteria through all of our schools. And a team worked together back in 09 and then again in 14, I believe, to actually put that criteria, look at it, update it. So we have a, a criteria in place. It, it, we are having a lot of students transfer in and then win the award. And a lot of our staff and families felt that wasn't fair. So this criteria requires four years in, in the Springfield Public Schools. Plus we have a different course criteria than some other schools too. So that's why that was put in place. And that criteria, of course, Roberta didn't qualify. We did work to offer her the opportunity to speak as a person with the highest GPA. And at the graduation, she declined that. And um, we understand she's disappointed at this point. But we met with her. We tried to uh, involve her in the program. We actually offered her to be part of the program and uh, recognized her for having a highest GPA. But there are several other students who transferred in in other schools as well that didn't, um, didn't win the award because they weren't in the Springfield. The team at the time was unanimous in saying that the kids who've been here for four years. We, that should be the ma a major consideration that was built into the criteria. We're always taking a look at it to update it. We met with Roberta. I share your you know, concern and we're very, very proud of Roberta. I would hate to be in your shoes, uh, Superintendent, as well as my good friend, Principal Aleem's shoes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Kevin's done a great job. Kevin's met with a family. Yolanda talked to the family in December. Uh, and again now, and we've all met with them trying to work through this, but obviously we couldn't change the criteria and take the award from the person who wanted to work on our guidelines. So we Thanks. we've done our best to work with them. Relative to your first question, I think that uh, we're already taking a look at that, and I have a reopening uh, task force that has been formed, and 
what I see in a traditional classroom, if this answers it, is typically, you know, our average class size is run from 20 to 25. So what I see is um, probably 24 desks in a classroom um, spread out with six foot distancing, um, two together and a, one for group A, one for group B for when the kids come in, that kind of thing, so that there's really about 12. And, uh, the kids in group A and group B would be using different desks, but we'd still sanitize and deep clean between the, when those groups come in. So that would be what a typical classroom looks like with at least six foot social distancing. I see the cafeteria is closed as we open the buildings and I see the transportation system the same way. We'll have to do the social distancing on the buses. And that, that's how I envision it, the smaller classes you know, again, if we're rotating some special ed students in and out, the same thing where there's usually 12, we probably only have six. So that's how I see us working the classrooms, but leaving the traditional desks in there because as we rotate the students, we'd have them use different desks so they'd stay sanitized. That kind of stuff. That's how I envision it looking in the fall. We're gonna keep working at that. And, and again, the guidance from the state could change too you know, as, as these infection rates change. So we'll be looking at that as well. Okay, well, thank you, Superintendent. Uh, uh, Justin? Yes, so Councilor Allen, yes. Yes, so. sorry, sorry I didn't reply before. I couldn't figure out, I stayed on my phone after my medical appointment, my eye doctor, rather than be disruptive. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge that I, I have been listening the whole time and uh, thank my colleagues for their questions and thank Danny and the, the city hall people for the great updates. Uh, I don't have a further question. I just didn't want to act like I was just hiding here or something. So I'm, uh, thank you every, everybody. Thank you, Councilor Allen. Uh, and we are 11 minutes past uh, the time in which we normally stop. Uh, just a few um, housekeeping items for the council. Uh, we are trying to fit in the budget meetings slash hearings. They certainly will be reduced in nature considering um, that, you know, we have to do everything remotely and there's only so much time in the day that Focus Springfield can devote uh, towards City Council. Council Letterman, I see your hand is raised, sir. Oh, please, please finish, Mr. President. I just had a um, question. So uh, we are going to have um, our Tuesday body camera meeting uh, where we will get a demonstration of the body cameras from 1130 to 1230 next week. Um, that has been confirmed. In addition, on Tuesday, this was the only time that we could coordinate between Focus Springfield and the Water and Sewer Commission. I know there were a couple of counselors that wanted to have an additional meeting. That will be set up on Tuesday from 3.30 to 4.30. Um, and then again, we'll have our Thursday update from 11.30 to 12.15, and the likelihood is high that right after that update, we will have um, one of a couple meetings with respect to the budget. Uh, originally, I was going to have TJ speak to the budget on Monday um, at 5.30, but it looks like in our email, we just received an invitation from the mayor to have a conversation around a lot of what is happening uh, with respect to uh, the, the George Floyd incident and the recent protests. So um, it doesn't look like that that timing will work for a budget meeting, although I know TJ is looking to announce the budget in the very near future, if not tomorrow. So um, I, stay tuned. I will send it to you in a, in a uh, hopefully comprehensive format in the next day or so once the budget meetings are solidified. And again, it will be a scaled down version. So I know we used to have three meetings uh, with the department heads. That will not be the case. And so we probably will be focusing on anywhere from 10 to 14 departments. And if we can do it all in one shot, then we will try to do so. Uh, if there, Councilor Letterman, I'll, I'll let you have the last word unless there are other questions. I was just wondering when we were going to receive the budget. Sounds like you've addressed that. Um, and, uh, you know, I certainly will be scrutinizing the budget in the same way that I always do. And I think everybody else will as well. So um, we appreciate the need to coordinate, um, but we also have a fiscal responsibility. So uh, I'm hopeful that we can, we can get that done. 
Absolutely. Look forward to certainly uh, having future conversations around how we can make that as seamless as possible. Uh, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.